What's up, everyone? We know the last thing you need is another fitness podcast to catch you up on the newest trends and fad diets, which is why myself and Tony made the Fitness Stuff podcast to make exercise and nutrition science practical. Our goal is to expose misinformation in the industry by providing only evidence-based education. And today, we are going to cover how you can determine how to get into a calorie deficit. Tony, how are we doing today? Freaking cloud <laughs> nine right now, because we just learned, we can show this. We just saw that we were ranked number 37 on Spotify Health and Fitness Podcast. I'm going to be a hot mess. I'm blacked out of happiness right now during this podcast. <laughs> yeah, I'm good so Don't take time, whatever I say. So. Yeah, don't take what I say. Seriously. But I'm a, really, this is because of you guys. And as always, this podcast will be free and you have free access to it all the time. But if you can, support us by giving us a rating on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, quick little five star. And if you want to type out a review, go the extra mile. That would be awesome. But we really appreciate you guys and your support. And we want to keep going. Rise to the top. You Feeling can do good. it right now. While you're listening, you can just go do it right now. That's enough of us <laughs> pushing our hidden agenda of getting five star ratings. But let's talk about this. How to set up a calorie deficit. Because here's my take. The fitness industry today, if you look good in leggings, if you got a six pack, whatever, <laughs> everyone hears the term to lose weight, to lose fat, you need a calorie deficit, you need a calorie deficit, you need it. But most people don't even understand what that means, in my opinion. Would you agree? Yeah, totally. Or they have an understanding and don't know how to set one up that's accurate for them. Exactly. People, people say it's easy, it's easy. And I think we've said this a few times on this podcast before. It's a simple idea, it's a simple mechanism. It's not easy to implement because it's a little bit complicated just based on your lifestyle, who you are, where you're at in your journey. So that's what we're here to talk about today is how to set one up, but first explain what it is in the first place. Because mm -hmm. I've made this argument before. I bet if you even ask fitness professionals, just anyone who coaches stuff like that in the industry, I would bet if you just asked everyone the simple question of what is a calorie? Can you define what a calorie is to me? I would say upwards of 80, 90% couldn't even do that. Yeah. Would you agree? Yeah, totally. I just think that's, it's crazy to me because the first thing you learn, whether you're getting a bachelor's degree in nutrition, you're taking a basic nutrition one-on-one course in college, the first thing you learn is what is a calorie? All, a whole unit on the calorie. And so it just goes to show how there's so such a lack of understanding and making the fundamentals a priority, even in those like online health coach programs and things like that. Like, mm -hmm. Which I'm even thinking back, I'm thinking, I'm like, I don't even know if, does NASM even teach you what that, I don't know. A lot of CPTs, like they miss a lot of very basic information. Yeah. Let's give you guys a, a crash course real quick on energy balance as a whole, which is massively important. But first of all, what that even is, let's start by the definition of a calorie. Do you think it's a good place to start? Yeah. The definition of a calorie is the energy needed to raise the temperature of one gram of water one degree celsius which people on this podcast are probably like, what the like who the heck i don't care about celsius or what like who, who cares about that what you should take away from that definition purely is a calorie isn't a thing like a calorie is not a thing you can touch or hold it's a unit of measurement yeah is what i think people should take away from that a calorie is not a physical thing it's yeah. a unit of measurement used to measure the energy in food the energy that we spend through our TDEE through the day. Yep. That's what people should get from it. Right? It's a unit of measurement. That's what yeah. it is in the first place. Yeah. Would you agree or add on top of that? No, I totally agree. And that's a fundamental definition. And then a more simplified version that you can maybe understand a little better is it's a unit of measurement. It's a unit of energy, simply put. What's the common thing? It's just like any unit of measurement. It's always the same. I think people mm -hmm. get this. It's like, oh, not every calorie is the same. What's inside of that calorie might not be, but a calorie is always a calorie, just like a mile, another unit of measurement, is always a mile, right? If you're going up a mountain, if you're going around a horse track, if you're going down the road, down the beach, a mile is always going to be exactly one mile. What that mile, what you do in that mile is going to be different, mm -hmm. but it's a mile just like a calorie is a calorie, and that's important to understand. Yeah, I think so too. I really like that you said it is no matter what the food is, it's still going to be the same thing. And that's where a lot of the misconception about the nutrition profile may be different, but we are literally talking about the calories here. We're not talking about whether or not this food has 
health benefits or how many vitamins and minerals mm-hmm. there are in it. The, we're talking about calories, like yes, totally the, separate. Yeah. And it's, it's important to understand these two things. Like the quality of those calories does matter, mm-hmm. but it's not the only thing that matters. Just like the quantity of calories matters a lot, but it's not the only thing that matters. That's an important yeah. thing to differentiate. And we'll get into because the calories you consume and where you consume them does to a large degree affect how your body responds to them, how you're able to perform, how you're able to recover, type of body weight you might be losing or gaining. That's important to cover, but we'll do that later. I think, let me start this with the lesson that we used in the course that we have, is explaining what energy balance is on a fundamental level, uh, on a scientific level. Do you think that's a good place to start? Yeah, I think so. Okay, because this is the argument people will make any excuse for, is that a calorie deficit doesn't work or energy balance is woo woo it's foo foo it's not based on science let's be clear in the last hundred years in the last century this has been the one fundamental truth in meaningful weight loss is a calorie deficit must be present that has never been overturned not once in the last hundred years of research that's very important to understand Mm -hmm. but let me explain this process to people because i think people are still under saying that's one thing but understanding it's another so Think of it like this. I think I learned this in eighth grade science class the first time. The laws of thermodynamics. Shout out to Mr. Hipley, I think was his name. Funny story. I was in an eighth grade science class. There was 32 people. There was 30 girls and two boys. And I was like a shy little chubby kid in science class. So I was Insert picture of Tony as a kid in eighth grade. Oh my God. But anywho, this is where it is. So shout out to Mr. Hipley if you're still doing science. But the laws of thermodynamics, let's focus on the first one which is energy cannot be created nor destroyed, just transferred. And now that we know that calories are referring to energy, we can start to apply those same laws, the Mm. first law of thermodynamics. So what does that mean? Energy cannot be created nor destroyed, only transferred. You can't just create energy out of nothing. You can't just destroy energy. You can only transfer it from one thing to another. Mm -hmm. So when we're talking about calories coming in and out of our body, in through the food and drink that we consume and out based on just our BMR, our daily movement, our digestion, our exercise, things like that that we covered in the TDEE episode. Those are the calories we're burning every day. If you consistently have more energy coming into your body than your body is spending, you can't just destroy that extra energy. You can't just get, it just doesn't just magically disappear. You have to store it and that's where we store extra energy body fat same thing with if we are constantly spending more calories or more energy than is coming in through food and drink that's where we lose weight from because our body can't just create energy out of nothing to hold on to body fat it has to give up part of itself and that's where meaningful weight loss and fat loss come from and i think that's very important to understand so that's that first level principle that we were talking about with bill on our show that's publishing monday is If for some reason you're trying a calorie deficit and you're not losing weight, you have to realize it's because some sort of factor, if it's lifestyle, if it's from your hormone profiles, from your inaccuracies in tracking, is not actually putting you in a calorie deficit because weight loss can only come from a calorie deficit. So if you're losing weight, you're in a calorie deficit. If you're not in a calorie deficit, and what's important I think is people get frustrated because they're like, I've tried so hard, I've tracked, I've done all this, and I haven't lost weight, how come? That must mean it's broken. It's not broken. We just have to now identify what of the hundred different reasons it could be was the reason that you thought you were in a deficit, but you're not. Yeah. Right. I think that's what we're going to go into next is let's start troubleshooting what things go into that calorie deficit, right? To set those calories we can go into because there's a lot and it can be a little frustrating, but I think to understand these things is the first step in overcoming them. Would you agree? I agree. So let's start there. Where do you think, and I think we could go in a lot of different directions for this, but in estimating how many calories we're taking in or burning, what's a good starting place? What's a good thing that might not be as solid as people think? Yeah, so definitely to not come right out of the gate with, I'm going to go online, I'm going to take a calculator, I'm going to insert my body weight, my age my height and my activity level and get a number that is generalized for your population. You should take two weeks, 
<laughs> is this too people specific? This. Stop, stop Pe- me. No, I stop love this. People, want. no, people hate this, but keep going. I, you're we'll you're ask, not going to like me for this, but it's fine. So what? Yeah, what do we do instead of the calculators? And we'll talk about why those calculators aren't great. But what do people do if they're like, I, what do you mean, don't use a calculator? What do yeah. people do? So I want you to for two weeks have no goals other than to get an understanding of how much you're eating. So you're going to go on to a MyFitnessPal and eat this much anywhere where you can record your food that you're eating and get a number. You're going to use a scale, a food scale to measure in grams, not a measuring cup. Mm -hmm. And you're going to pay attention to also if you're measuring those foods cooked versus raw, another point, and get an understanding of how much you're eating for two weeks. So track the food that you're eating without the intent to change anything. Don't tell yourself you're going on a diet. Don't tell yourself you're going on, which is frustrating because people want change now. But we got to drop those expectations. Meaningful change takes time. In the two weeks that you're going to take to not change your diet, but just to observe it, to fully understand what's coming into your body, I think will make the next steps countless times easier in setting up the right deficit that you can maintain that's easy that's not going to ruin your lifestyle would you agree i think the two weeks that you spend pausing and observing makes the next few months massively easier yeah it's so important to have proper framing around how you're using these trackers looking at them as an educational tool to guide you not hold control over your life and Mm -hmm. what you should and shouldn't should be eating it's really to help you understand what is a proper portion size for me or how much am i actually eating i thought i was eating 1500 calories a day oh my god i'm accurately tracking for two weeks i've been eating on average 2600 Mm -hmm. that if you and then this is the second level weigh yourself daily during those two weeks. Why is that important, Tony? You can elaborate on that a little bit. We'll get into the space of are we even in a good place to go into a deficit later, Mm -hmm. but why taking daily weigh-ins matters over the course of those two weeks while you're observing what you eat is that's going to tell you pretty much exactly, more accurate than any calculator you could find, where your caloric maintenance is. Or if you're unfamiliar, caloric maintenance meaning how many calories your body is running off of where if you eat that many, you're not going to gain nor lose weight. Mm -hmm. Here's why is because over the two weeks, let's say you're tracking your food and you figure out that you're you're, you're taking in an average of, let's say, 2,600 calories per day. Because most people, even if they don't eat meal plans or meal prep, surprisingly eat a a very close to average calorie intake a day. They might vary by 100 or 2 calories in either direction. But let's say you average 2,600. If you're weighing yourself daily, you're going to get an average of what your weight is over the course of those two weeks because your weight can fluctuate over five pounds in water weight alone. So taking one or two measurements isn't going to tell you much. The more data points you have, the better. That's why you do it daily and typically in the morning. But you can observe, let's say over those two weeks, you were taking in 2,600 calories. Your starting average weight was around, let's say, 182. And your finishing weight was still averaging right around 182 you can pretty much say with certainty your maintenance is right around that 2,600 mark. That's going to give you grounds to set up your calorie deficit or to set up a surplus if you're trying to gain weight. Mm-hmm. And same thing. If you're gaining a couple pounds over the course of those two weeks, it's safe to say that 2,600 might be putting your body in a calorie surplus. Or if you're losing weight, 2,600 might be putting you in a calorie deficit without you knowing it. That's how I see weigh helping. Mm-hmm. Would yeah. that miss the marker? Is there anything that you might add on top that might be another benefit from it? Well, yeah, I don't think I can add. I think that you said it perfectly, and that's exactly like what I explained to my clients as well. And I think this can go into the topic of you may think that you're eating a certain amount of calories in a day. The common, I eat like 1,300, 1,400 calories a day, and I cannot lose weight. Ugh, yeah. The reality, that's, that's hard to swallow. The reality of that is you are not eating 1,300 to 1,400 mm-hmm. calories a day. And before we jump into that, may I ask you this? Because I think people might be like, wait a second, skipped over this. I want to ask you this. Why is doing that for two weeks better than using a calculator online? Because, one, calculators are based, they make generalizations. They can't look at the individual and take into account all of these factors like their, the different components of your TDE, so your total yeah. daily energy expenditure, which we've talked about before. They can't take into account your NEAT, which is your non-exercise activity thermogenesis, so how much you're moving throughout the day that isn't exercise. 
They take into account your exercise, which again, what percentage is that of your TDEE? Less than 5 to 15%, depending on the person. Yep. They don't take into account the thermogenic effect of food. So say you have mm-hmm. a pretty high protein diet, which takes more energy to digest. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, that's going to be a little bit different. And then your BMR is highly var- variable from person to person. Yes, yeah. it takes your height and your weight and your age, but that's it. It can't take into mm-hmm. account genetic components. If you have any other biomarkers that like thyroid issue or hormonal imbalances, things like that, doesn't take that into account. So they can be very inaccurate. It's taking a large group of people, Mm -hmm. an average from a very large population and saying, oh, well, this is what people your age and your weight and your height should be eating on average out of millions of people. Five or six data points, your height, your weight, maybe your lean body mass, your age. It takes five or six data points and gives you a number that you would need probably close to 100 data points to accurately find out. So that's why observing how your body is acting is so much better than just using a calculator. Yeah. I think I I also love examples. So again, this is I'm going to talk about me, for example. This is just me, but it can help apply more of an understanding of how inaccurate this can be. So I'm a six foot tall female. I weigh like 142, 143, and I am very active, ADHD, like always moving, maybe get 15,000 steps a day. All right. So I put into a calculator all of that. And I'd say on average, like I am maintenance is around 2,800 to 3,000 calories for me. People will think Mm -hmm. of that and be like, what? Again, I'm six feet tall. And genetically, like we have a very high metabolic rate in my family. That's just how it is. For me to be in a deficit, I will get like 1,800, 1,900 calories spit out to me, Mm -hmm. which has happened before. I was 18 years old and went down that road and maybe stuck to it for two or three weeks because I was absolutely starving. I'm like, there's no way. It it took you well over a thousand calories below your maintenance, which is a massive, and we're talking about, we'll talk about the numbers of how to set up a deficit when you know that, but that's what, that's almost a, that's a third less than you were burning. That's not something you could sustain for a long time. Yeah. And so, whereas a nice, easy, say deficit for me is around like 24, 2,500 calories. That is a significant difference. And Sometimes these calculators just make, it can make it so much harder. Mm-hmm. You sh- it shouldn't and have to be that terrible. <laughs> terrible. It, and yeah. the formula, and the for- it really depends too on what calculator you use because people don't even know there's different formulas to use. If I had to use one, there's one called the catch McArdle formula, which does at least take into account your lean body mass versus just your total body mass and weight. So it takes into account your muscle versus fat mass, which is a little bit better. But most calculators online are using something called the Mifflin St. Jor, which just takes your body weight. And yeah. I think this is even a good example, too, where it's like you could type, again, either one of us. I'll use myself as an example because I carry like a, quite a bit of muscle mass, right? I'm 220 pounds, 6'3". If I put myself into both of those calculations, if I use Catch McArdle, it's going to know that I have a lot more muscle mass and that I'm going to burn a lot more during the day because of that. Mm-hmm. If I just type it into a, most calculators, which use Mifflin St. Jor, and it just takes that my body weight, I'm in the BMI, like almost obese category yeah. because of that. <laughs> it's going to tell me I need a lot less calories than I actually do. Same thing. People who have been working out for years and gradually increasing their intake, it is a surprising amount of how high your calories might be at maintenance. I've met bodybuilders who to maintain need roughly 4,500 calories a day. So a deficit of 4,000 calories, they're starving, which surprises people. It's insane. Yeah. So it's a wide range and we say, go listen to that TDE episode to really understand how you can maximize that. But that's why we don't use calculators. But mm-hmm. to the next point, and I think people are like, okay, let's say they, they do this. Or let's say this common claim that you just brought up. I eat 1,200 calories a day and I'm not losing weight. Because here's the thing too. If you use those calculators and you're a shorter female who carries a little bit of body fat and not very active, if you're like 5'2", five, 5'3", five, you weigh, let's say, 180 pounds, and you're not super active at the moment, if you type that into a calculator, it's going to tell you for a calorie deficit, you need to be eating 1,000 to 1,200 calories. Yeah. It, which is not where you need to be. And we'll preface this by now. We never got your low. I've never taken a, a client below even 1,500, no matter how small that individual is. And that's even, I don't even like to go 
that low for fat loss. Yeah. It's not beneficial. I want you to eat as much as you possibly can, which with that comes experimentation, which I feel like a lot of people are scared to do because they have this Mm -hmm. idea in their head that, wait, I, especially women, like you, you mean I should start eating like 2000 calories a day? Yeah. I want you to be able to eat as much as you possibly can. Like what? (laughs) <laughs> yeah, it's. Ter- I think it's terrifying, especially in women, to increase their calories. Because a lot of people, and we'll talk about a couple of different things, but let's talk about first why, because I bet a lot of people listening are like, I've tried 1,200, I've tried 1,500, I've tried a calorie deficit, and it did not work for me. Mm-hmm. We're going to explain a lot of the common ones, at least roadblocks that get in the way of why you may have thought you were in a calorie deficit, but you weren't, yeah. right? You may have, because increasing your calories then, because a lot of the time for those individuals, increasing their calorie goal of let's say I have a client coming in a female who's reportedly taking in 1200 calories a day which is essentially starving yourself it's surprising when I say let's try and bump up let's set a goal of 17 or 1800 calories because what they'll realize is that's a goal that they can stick to seven days a week Mm -hmm. because one Mm -hmm. thing before we get into the weeds a little bit a lot of people that are eating these very low calorie diets tend to do it during the week or a few days they're able to pile drive but hunger always wins it in does. dieting. No matter how your willpower, how motivated, hunger will always win. So you might end up eating 1,200 calories Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday. And this is where binge episodes, this is where severely overeating calories, which is not hard to eat a couple thousand calories in a meal or two eating out. Yeah. That's when that happens on the weekend where a calorie deficit is not a day-by-day thing. It's not a reset at midnight tool. It's a, an ongoing process. So over the weekend, you're consuming three or 4,000 calories on Saturday, Sunday, and you starve yourself Monday through Friday, it's going to level right out. And that might be why you're not losing weight. That's a first small reason. Yeah. I want to preface real quick before mm-hmm. I, and I know Tony does this too, but before we're even talking about what your mm-hmm. calorie deficit should be, we're addressing your hunger level levels. We're addressing if you do constantly get to that point where you have these binge eating episodes because you can't figure out your hunger and fullness, or you have a poor relationship with food, or you really struggle to understand how much you should and shouldn't be eating because of diet culture and past dieting Mm -hmm. experience. Like we are working on that first because I call it, this might sound stupid, but your hunger demon, if you don't know how to silence that, I like that. We're not getting, we're not getting anywhere. So just wanted to preface that real quick. Good. Yeah. We'll say that because this episode is specifically on setting a calorie deficit. I think we should do a follow-up episode on should you even do it? Should you yeah. aim for a calorie deficit? One. And then two, ways to be in a calorie deficit without tracking food. Because yeah. all that has yeah. to happen for weight loss is a calorie deficit has to be present. You can do that without ever downloading MyFitnessPal, with yeah. ever out downloading. There's a hundred ways. We're specifically talking about those set goals today. So that is a good preface. Good call yeah. out on that. Follow up episode. As we go Definitely. into it. So let's talk about the few things. Because people are frustrated here is I've tried it, I've tried it, and it did not work. I know you've got some stuff you want to talk about. I know I've got a study at the Columbia University Hospital I was going to bring up in tracking reports. But do you want to start us off? What are some things that that get in the way of people who think they're eating in a deficit who might not be yeah. outside of the consistency factor seven days a week? Yeah, I'll start with this point because it's pro- it has probably the least effect. Like it's not going to always be your make or break. But in the long term, if you are at a point where you feel like you're have more lean muscle mass and you just you want to make the smallest bit of a change go the extra level this could impact you and labels are allowed to have a 20 percent deviation from the actual calories that are listed so the That's FD, fda right yeah fda allows for a 20 percent difference so that label could be as much as 20 percent more total calories and that's totally fine. And that's not going to be listed. You're not going to know. Mm -hmm. A lot of that just accounts for natural human or even machine operating error when it comes to putting together foods. Um, And one study that tested 24 common snack foods found that it's actually carbohydrates that are overestimated Mm. by on average like 7.7%, which accounts for around 40% of this calorie difference. And then errors in terms of weight of the serving size Mm. being underestimated, which accounts for around, I think it was like 60%. So there are errors there. So if you think, again, if this is over time, every day, multiple foods, if you're having 
more foods that come in a package and you're really relying on what those food labels say over time, that can make a difference. Yeah, which is essentially too what I'm hearing is, and I think we're into it, tracking food is not something you can just pick up and do most. It's hard. The way I like to describe it is it's essentially learning a new language. You're learning how to read food. Think of it, whatever language you do not know right now. If you go to France and you don't know French, it's not just something like, oh, I'm going to France next month. I'll just start speaking French. No, you can't. You have to learn how to speak the language. Mm -hmm. You have to learn how to track your food because what's on the label, one, might not be that accurate. And then making sure that you're actually eating the serving size is the next hardest part. Yeah. Right. If you're not using a food scale, weighing in grams, which we're not saying everyone needs to do that with everything they put in their mouth. But again, on the accuracy scale, the more accurate you can be, the more you're going to know exactly where you are. And that's the most accurate way to do it is by using a food scale set out in grams. Because yeah. even a serving size in cookies or chips that says, oh, about 13 chips, you might weigh it and realize it's like eight chips. Give me the weight. It's like one, it says I always, I don't yeah. track right now. I typically don't really need to track. But I, if I don't weigh my protein powder and I just do one scoop, oftentimes mm -hmm. I need more. I need more to hit my one serving. Yeah. Which is, and, and it depends on the protein powder, the consistency. Some you yeah. might need less, but yeah, I just think about that all the time. But yeah, things like that, it's not as exact, which sucks because it's not as easy as it, we wish it would be, but it's just because think about it's, it's just such a massive scale that it's almost impossible to control at that level. But to the point of, of tracking hard, I do want to go over this study done at Columbia University College a while back for a lot of these people that are frustrated with the tracking. Now, this study done at the Columbia University College, this was done a while ago with 224 obese individuals, 224 people that were obese on the BMI chart. These individuals had self-reportedly be taking in less than 1,200 calories per day and not losing weight. That was to get into the study. They were self-reporting that they were only eating 1,200 calories a day tracking and they were not losing weight. Now, on the side of this study, this was leading a lot of these individuals to think that they had self-diagnosed thyroid disease, metabolic disease or syndrome. These things that would maybe get in the way of a calorie deficit or why that wasn't responding the way they thought it was. If you're in the obese category and you're only eating 1,200 calories a day consistently, your weight is going to plummet. Your metabolism you, isn't broken. It's not. Yeah, that's nothing. So if you're over, if you're obese and you're only eating 1,200 calories, I promise you your weight's going to be dropping. So if you think you are, listen to this. In this study, they measured the accurate intake over two consecutive weeks of these individuals. So the Research followed these individuals, tracked and accurately measured what they were eating and found that on average, these individuals were taking in over a thousand calories on average, underreporting a thousand calories every single day, self-reportedly. And it was ranging upwards of 1600 calories being underestimated, meaning they thought they were taking in 1200. In reality, they were taking in over 2300, at least over 2300 every day just because they didn't know what they were eating. They thought they were tracking. So just because you're tracking doesn't mean that's what you're actually eating. And that is the most frustrating thing in the world for mm -hmm. people to hear is because you're like, I put all this effort into tracking. I get the food, get whatever. And you're telling me I might still be off. It's a skill that you have to sharpen to understand it, which I think is well worth it. But it's frustrating at it's, first yeah. to realize that. I really love that study and love sharing it with people because – a lot of times people just don't believe you when you say that. But then in terms of I'm a big fan with my clients of being compassionate with the fact that we live in America where there is one mm -hmm. absolutely no teaching on what serving size is and our serving sizes are absolutely <laughs> ridiculous. So if you read something that is, okay, this is one serving is this many calories and you think, oh yeah, this is, if you, yeah, this is one serving. I'm eating one serving. Don't do that. It's the classic <laughs> example, right? Oreos is like the serving size for, or thin mints for Girl Scout cookies is mm -hmm. two thin mints. And it's like, name one person who only eats two thin mints yeah. at a time. So people grab thin mints and be like, oh, scan the label. That's what I ate. But it's like, oh, I just ate eight thin mints. I only tracked two. Yeah. That's a lot of places where, because think about it, well over a thousand calories to 1600 under reporting is easily enough to erase any sort of deficit that these individuals might have thought they were in. They figured this out afterwards. They were all healthy. They didn't have hypothyroidism. They didn't have metabolic syndrome or disease. These were healthy individuals. It's just because they didn't know how to track. 
Yeah. That's the empathy wise. Is because first you're going to be like this. It, it's going to make you want to quit. But I think this is the biggest piece is you got to really understand what you're playing with here in order to succeed. You have to understand going into it, this is not going to be something you're going to succeed at immediately. It's, you're going to yeah. fail a lot, but that's kind of trial and error. That's how you make progress in any metric, yeah. in my opinion. And having the, there, it's really important to, I feel like I'm being repetitive here, but really seeing this as, okay, I'm going to learn from this. I'm going to learn what a mm-hmm. portion or a serving size is for me because trackers are not forever that is never ever the goal you are a human being who should be able to make food decisions without a phone telling you what to do so really taking your time to understand what this looks like how you feel after eating this type of food or this serving do i need a little more here like really do that because it will be so beneficial in the long term eventually you'll just start making decisions and subconsciously be like, Oh, I know what this looks like for me. The goal is not just to, what do I need to do to lose weight? Do I need to track? Do I need to, it's not, don't do it for that reason. Do it to understand. Cause yeah, that's our goal with Mindset every is single, everything. even with mm-hmm. us, our clients, everything is you go into it to learn the skill of understanding food where I'll go through fear, like periods of tracking when I'm trying to really line up my diet, if I'm going into a deficit or a surplus. But then the goal is once I get there, I can wean off. Cause I pretty much understand what I'm putting into my body I'm measuring the output so I know if anything's off. The goal is to learn and understand these, which should always be the number one goal. Now, I want to say that before we lead into what I think people really want to hear, which is, okay, bro, I know how to track. I got this. What should my calorie deficit be? How do I set that up? Mm-hmm. That's what we're going to get into next. So I wanted to preface that by I know people listening to this. So in setting up and understanding how to track food, I wanted to wrap up there. What other kind of notes would you put on the issues with tracking with underestimating what other things are getting in the way if you can think of any that we didn't cover i don't think we missed any yeah pretty much the goal there was to understand like it's not the easiest thing in the world Mm -hmm. but honestly if you put enthusiastic effort into it for 30 days you will understand 60 70 percent of the way there it's not something you need to do for 10 years Mm -hmm. it's something that if you put enthusiastic effort to for a few months you're going to in my opinion, as an average individual, tracking your macros, and I know it's not, we talked about this, it's not setting specific every macro goal, but tracking your macros and calories, in my opinion, with enthusiastic effort for three to six months will give you a better understanding of nutrition than any course that you could go take, than anything like that from an outsider's perspective. Mm-hmm. Like just from someone who wants to understand food, you could read books, you could do these things, which will give you a good understanding, but doing it, like getting in the trench and doing it, will give you a better understanding because you're actually seeing how it's responding in your body. Yeah, yeah. I wanted to make one point. We could put this at the beginning if we want to. But I, when we were talking about how, yes, a calorie is a unit of energy, that energy Mm -hmm. is the same, that calorie is the same. But how calories are measured is inside a machine. It's called a bomb calorimeter. That is a machine we are humans how we absorb and transfer that energy is different from a standard machine so that's why we talk about like you know protein is big protein is very important because how much energy it takes mm-hmm. to absorb digest all of that so there are differences there i really want you to understand that because that if you think of calories all the same in terms of mm-hmm. we all use them the same way then you can you only look at it from like a metric standpoint also go the extra level as you're doing this to be like oh so this is i feel more full after i'm eating protein that makes sense because of how i'm absorbing it digesting it little things like that can keep you from having this like strict goal of I have to eat this number or else I'm a failure. Like that is absolutely never going to lead to success. So I just had to point that out because I really wanted to mention that in the beginning and forgot. <laughs> no, I think that's a good kind of put to add in. Cause this is, I think this will be a good, cause I think we honestly might have two or three episodes to stem off of this Yeah. in how you see it, but it's really an educational tool how to do it. But now let's talk about how we set up a deficit. Now we will preface this too, where it's like, a, we talked about this with Bill Campbell, which his podcast is coming out on Monday after this one. So listen to that because he has published over 200 research paper and he gives us the principles of nutrition, of dieting, when like what really matters, what has to happen. And ultimately when it comes down to it, and this is why the idea of flexible dieting or tracking your macros 
has become so popular is because weight loss, fat loss, gaining weight comes down to calorie intake versus output. And the second component would be your protein intake. Mm -hmm. And people hear that and they think, okay, so if a calorie deficit for me is 1800, like he said, you could technically lose body fat by just eating 1800 calories worth of fruity pebbles every day. Yeah. Not eating any whole foods, anything in that measure, whatever you want to consider healthy, you can still do it. That doesn't mean you should. And people are, you know, always confused about this, especially that's another one. If you ever look up Professor Mark Hobbs, who was a professor of nutrition, I forget what university, but did you see that where he did a self experiment for over two months? He lost over 27 yeah, pounds. Yeah, I did see that. Yeah, over 27 pounds eating what he called like the gas station diet, like mm-hmm. Twinkies, Doritos, things like that. He lost 27. And actually, the weird part is his metrics and biomarkers in his blood actually improved instead of got worse, which people were always like, yeah, look at his yeah. internal. I think it was also just because losing weight is typically a healthy thing for yeah, people who are yeah. overweight. I but mean, health total. And weight. And whatever yeah. people confuse. Total about. side conversation. So when we talk about setting up a deficit, so we've gotten to the point where we got to understand where our maintenance is first. <laughs> 38 minutes, we got to that point of where finding out where your maintenance is. Now, setting up a calorie deficit, you have to take a few things into account. Here's the few things that I see take into account is one, something that you can do consistently. Because meaningful weight loss is not going to take one or two weeks. It's going to take weeks to months. Mm -hmm. So if you can't see yourself doing this every day for 30, 60, 90 plus days. It's going to take months. Yeah. And for most people, it is going to take months to years. For most people, people, it is going to take months to years. So if you can't see yourself doing this, it's not going to work. Realize Mm -hmm. that when you're setting a deficit. Now, we get into this and just from one, the evidence-based point of view, we can take what literature says and then also through anecdotal experience with us, ourselves, and our clients – I've found a good window, and I want you to say what you think on this. The goal when you're losing weight is to maintain your muscle mass and make sure the weight you're losing is coming from fat. It's fat loss, not weight loss. That's always the goal that I tend to say. Where if you go into too restrictive of a deficit, too large of a deficit, you will lose muscle, especially if you're not getting enough protein in your diet. So a good thing in literature that I've found is a window between about 20 and 30 literature even up to 35% in some short-term trials, is about the max window of a deficit that you can enter without losing muscle mass as you lose weight. I cut that to, I usually cap it at about 30% just because most research done on above that is like two to four weeks, which you can't get the best readings on. But I like to stick in a window of 20 to 30% of a deficit, meaning if your maintenance is, I'm gonna have to do some math real quick. If your maintenance is 2,500 calories a day, eating only 70 to 80% of those calories. So 20 to 30% less than 2,500, which if I did it in my head, let's say 25% deficit would be 250, 500 plus 175, 675 calories less than that. I, I should break out a calculator, but That's 600, tw- 625, you're close. 625 less than yeah. 2,500, which would be 1875. Right. Yeah, which like for me, like I hear that and because I have, Tony and I have a little bit of a different client pace because I work a lot more on starting from let's build our relationship with food, mm-hmm. let's improve how we view food first. So like I hear 625 and this is good for me to share because I feel like you yeah. are allowed to hear that number and be like, wait, I can't, that's too much. That's okay yeah. if that sounds like too much for yeah. some people it is like. Big time. That's, yeah, that's one specific example. I'm just saying 20 to 30% Mm -hmm. of, and this is, again, after we have not only realized where we are maintenance level, but have maximized that. If you're not getting 10,000 steps a day, if you're not training, and especially weight training several times a week, if you're not eating a high protein diet, if you're not sleeping well, things like that, you're going to be severely limited by how much wiggle room you actually have when it comes to setting up a deficit, right? Maximize how much your output is first mm-hmm. before you decide to do that to yeah. each step. Yeah. And like, so what's you your can, thought on those numbers? I wanted to mention real quick, mm-hmm. notice how Tony did not say, if my client wants to be this weight by this date, this is how much they need to lose per week to get to that date. Just so you know, a lot of calculators will ask you, how much weight do you want to lose by when? Avoid that at all costs because not sustainable and also will not allow for consistency. If you have an Mm -hmm. end goal and end date, that 
it's going to throw you off from what's really important. And that's like the mm-hmm. educational piece. Don't just set what... time goals for weight loss. That's, that's <laughs> all, it's not only a losing game in just setting up. It just logically doesn't make sense based on how different bodies respond to. Yeah, you're setting you know, yourself just... up for failure because yeah. it doesn't allow for any tweaking and learning and changing throughout the process and journey. And that's what this mm-hmm. is. You can um, say I want to lose weight by my wedding in six months, but don't say I need to lose 40 pounds by... March mm-hmm. 5th or whatever yeah. it is. That's just not the way to do it. You can say, I want to make progress by March 5th. Do not put a number on the progress you want to make because it just, it makes zero yeah. sense. Yeah. And we're not talking so. to the bodybuilders who have a competition. I'm not talking yeah. to you guys. You're yeah. good. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But, so on the numbers that I gave, how do you think about those? That's the deficit I like to set up of not going over. And typically I don't go under if you want to see meaningful progress, but there are scenarios where going under a 20% deficit makes sense, right? I typically, I'd say on average around a 15% deficit with my clients. So that's, for example, say someone's eating 2,500 maintenance, Mm -hmm. that would be around 375 calories a day less. Does that sound about right? We'll have a calculator after the show, but 15% Um, less than 2,500. Yeah. Yeah. So that is- And that's because though your client base is more who? So I'm working with, in the beginning, I'm talking about like we're taking a month to a month and a half before to understand our hunger and our fullness cues. We have had a large history of dieting, either yo-yo dieting, Mm -hmm. falling to a lot of extreme crash diets. And I don't understand like how much I need to eat for my body, kind of what food should look like how I can strengthen my relationship with food so I don't look at it as something that is an enemy. So we're doing that beforehand. And some people don't even, I don't even take them to a place to track. That's just not even where we go. Mm -hmm. And we'll talk, we'll have another episode on this for what I would do with them. But for the people who we do get into a comfortable place to start tracking and we start low, you can always increase it. So I never want it to feel daunting, never want it to feel like something that's setting you up for for any sort of failure. I feel really confident in you and you feel confident in yourself that like, oh, I really think, believe I can do this. And even if you don't, this is a learning experience and there's always room to increase, but 15% is around that sweet spot I find. A very good starting place for sure. Yeah. yeah. So starting out, giving like recommendations to people listening, if you come from a very restrictive past where eating a lot of food scares you or that restrictiveness scares you, if, you've, if you're used to the old coaches who you got to eat 1,200, if that lowerness just scares the crap out of you, but you're at a place where you can start tracking and setting those goals, 15% is a great place. Will you see the fastest progress you could be? No. But again, That's quickness not is not always the goal. Quickness mm-hmm. is not always the goal. If you feel good at 15%, but you're like, man, I feel good. I'm not really hungry through the day. I, I just wish I was seeing a little bit quicker weight loss or a little bit quicker mm-hmm. progress, which I'm, I want to be careful with what those words yeah. mean to people because faster does not equal better one and two. When I'm saying quicker, I'm talking about if 15% is giving you about a half a pound Yeah. or we usually base this off the percentage, but you know, that's around like a half. A, yeah. I yeah. like a half a pound for per week, per, really transparent about that. And again, and run it for the yeah. long haul, not. Yeah. And if you're feeling good and you're confident and you're like, this is, I feel great in my training and my nutrition and my hunger cues, let's step it up. Let's try 20, 25%, 30% on the max, but ease into it. And you'll see a little bit quicker where we can't, we don't want to say two pounds a week or whatever. We don't want to mm-hmm. give those recommendations because everybody's different based yeah. on your starting point. But and it, don't be expecting three, four, five, six, seven, eight pounds a week based on that freaking TV commercial or Instagram ad that you saw, because that's not realistic. It's not real. And it goes the other way around too. We didn't have to really go through much of building our relationship with food right off the bat. We're starting around 20, 25%. And we're also starting a new training program where you haven't been weightlifting. That I always say, you might, this might actually be way too low. You find after a few weeks, you might be really hungry we can increase this. So just Mm -hmm. be transparent with me, be honest with me and let me know how you're feeling because nine times out of 10, if that is the case and we increase your calories, maybe by even 100, 150, that can make a huge difference and you start to see progress. So it's not linear at all. Yeah. And two things I want to do to tie this in is one, where you start usually doesn't matter. It's how you adjust to Mm -hmm. how you're making progress. I think that's a good point that she was just talking, and this is obviously we work one-on-one with clients, but if you're doing this on your own, 
Keep paying attention to your progress. Keep weighing yourself if that's what you did in the beginning and you're comfortable with it. Keep paying attention to your strength in the gym, how your physique is changing, measurements if you can. Because if a deficit that starts for you works and it starts to not work later, you got to realize that you're not making progress. It's hard if you're not measuring progress. Yeah. Because you can never know if you just feel like you're not making progress. It's better to have the data of, oh, I was losing 1.5 pounds a week on average for six weeks and now I've stopped. Why is that? Instead of just guessing, oh, I haven't really been weighing myself, but I feel like I'm not making progress. It's better to have that data so you can adjust. Yeah. And if you don't like to weigh yourself, like I I see it all the time, a lot, especially in women who are starting, are really working out in the gym, resistance training, aren't losing any weight, Mm -hmm. but their body composition is changing a lot. And they go and try on a pair of jeans that may not fit over their thighs, but their waist is so much smaller and they feel so much better in their prog. There's so many ways to use it, whether it's progress pictures, pair of pants, like the scale is fine. Some people hate the scale. There is a way. Plenty of tools. Yeah. That's huge is learning where to move. And don't just weigh yourself. Don't just take progress. Do what you can and do as many as you can. Mm -hmm. And then the last thing I want to talk about in mind with this that I don't think we can spend too much time because I know we're going to do a separate episode on reverse dieting with a case study of one of my clients. But I do want to bring that up in the sense of when you're planning a deficit, you should at least have in your mind an exit strategy for when you make the progress you want to see because that's one thing people forget. You're not entering a deficit forever. (laughs) Dieting is not forever. No. And you should and need an exit strategy for when you get there. If you lose 20 pounds and that's your goal, and you return back to eating just like you were beforehand, odds are you are going to gain weight back quickly. That's what you want to avoid is not the regain, right? You don't want to lose Mm -hmm. 20 pounds for the next six months. You want to lose 20 pounds and keep it off forever or whatever that goal might be. And a reverse diet is a strategy that you can use to do that where you ladder up, where you increase your calories by anywhere from 50 to 200 calories every one to two weeks after you're coming out to give your your metabolism a chance to almost, I don't, it's hard because we could, we would really spend a whole episode on this, Yeah. but a chance to bounce back up to your maintenance without experiencing weight gain. Yeah. You should have that plan instead of just, oh, I'll figure it out once I lose the weight. Have that plan in mind. Yeah. Tell yourself, when is it going to be a good time to exit my strategy? And I think in that episode, we can talk about diet breaks, breaks refeeds, reverse the, dieting. We can do a lot yeah. of that because that's important to know. And a lot of this is, yes, the, the numbers are important if you want to see progress but we have been hinting at this the whole time this is behavior change based so you have to figure out and learn how this is going to fit into your lifestyle it is not just a temporary period of your life where you're being really strict and really disciplined it is something that you're constantly like oh i actually i could do this forever i'm excited to do this or maybe i'm not so excited about this part of it but I know this change that I'm making, I can take with me forever. Like, very important. Yeah, yeah. This, yeah, because I think yeah, that, that'd be a great second episode to do on. This is the objective things that are happening while you're losing weight. I think a secondary episode would be the more application based. Let's say, okay, here are the hundreds of things that happen in your lifestyle, like what we were talking about with Bill, meal timing how you distribute those through the day. Yeah. Should you be taking diet breaks every several weeks? What the hell is a diet break? What's an extra strategy? Like, we sh- like all those things matter, and those are the specifics. This is the objective 30,000 feet up. Here's what's going to be happening when you're losing weight for fat loss. That's what we wanted to give you the instruction today on. If you're frustrated because of it, know that's normal and that's okay, and you should be because it's a lot deeper and more complex of a subject than just the objective numbers that we gave you guys today, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. That's the objectiveness. I think we'll go subjective next. That's Does awesome. that sound good? Am I speaking yeah. outside of my lane? <laughs> no, I think we could wrap it up with just a few key takeaways. Sorry. List them out. What you got? First off, if you have no idea where you're starting or you think you may be low balling or high balling how much you're eating, track how much you're eating for a day for two weeks and weigh yourself every day until you see And if you are seeing a lot of fluctuations in weight, all right, I'm going to do it for another week until I get at this maintenance and take the average of those calories for your maintenance. Yeah. Yeah. Make your goal to understand before take action. Yeah. Don't just, Mm -hmm. the goal is not action. The goal is to understand. Okay. So that's a perfect first one. Understand before you take action. Second one, once you are at a point where you understand what your maintenance calories are and, or if you already do know, let's start at around, I would say like, would you say a 20% deficit? 
starting point? I mean, it's, point? those are where it's, you got to measure a lot. So maybe that's in that secondary. Between. Which is, it really depends. The larger of a deficit you go into, the more lifestyle you're going to have to give up to get there. The less eating yeah. out with friends, the less drink, whatever it is, the less lifestyle flexibility you t- typically have. So it's a decision you got to make on your own. Do I want to have a little bit more flexibility in my lifestyle mm-hmm. and go with a lower deficit? Yeah. Or do I want a little bit quicker results but a lot less flexibility in my lifestyle. That's where it's always a little bit harder. Yeah, I don't like that. I led with a number there because it's so individual. So I think even that point is best to think about what's going to be realistic within your life and how you live. What What do you actually want? Don't just say I want weight loss, but it's like, what do you want that weight loss to look like? Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Okay. So that's okay. Awesome. Two points to start out with. Is there a third? There's a third. Uh, Is there a third? Do you want a third? I think that's actually really important. Measure in grams. Measure in grams. <laughs> measure in grams. Yeah, tattoo that. Measure in grams. Don't measure another way if you do the yeah. food scale. Measure in grams. And that's a. I think that's a good starting base and intro. And I think next we'll get into diet exit strategies, diet breaks, how to set up. What you can and do again, instead this of is, tracking if it's this not is, for you. Oh, yeah. Another episode on how to be in a deficit without tracking if that's mm-hmm. not where you're at. Because that's the first thing before you even listen to this whole episode. Very convenient, Tony, to bring this up at the end. Even though I think we talked uh, yeah, about what? it at the beginning a little bit. Yeah. But once you get to the point where you can and should track from a mental health perspective, from a lifestyle perspective, this is what matters next. Yeah. If you're not in a place and people are like mocking off the mental health, whatever, that's a serious issue. If your mental health, if your lifestyle tracking does not make sense, you're going to just be spinning your wheels and it's just going to probably damage it further. Yeah. I so think get to a good place first. If you are struggling with disordered eating or have an eating disorder and the idea of counting your calories completely sets that off, do not listen to this video. This is yeah. not for you. You're not really, there yet. Yeah. And that's okay. You're not there yet. That's okay. Yeah. 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 Again, because <laughs> you don't need to track to lose weight. Mm-hmm. But if you have a disordered eating past, if you've struggled with this before... That'll be the next episode that we can touch on is how yeah. do we set things up to where you don't need to track? Because there's yeah. plenty of things you can do. This is the measured, structured way. It's yeah. not the only way. So I think that's a good place to tie a bow and wrap it up. Let's wrap this up by, of course, showing y'all where you can find us. It's fs.pod on TikTok, on Instagram. We just hit 10,000 followers. Hopefully, if you're listening to this a year in the future, we're at like a billion right now. But fs.pod on Instagram and TikTok where we release all the clips, upcoming polls, guests coming on. Our YouTube page is fitness stuff in parentheses for normal people where you can see the video clips, but you can see those on Spotify as well. And we got a couple fun things coming. Podcast with Bill dropping on Monday. Bill Mm -hmm. Campbell, our favorite freaking guest yet. We really do appreciate even just like honest ratings that you guys give us because we like feedback. We're really trying to improve. We'll take any honest feedback. You can DM us. If you have supported us by giving a a five-star rating so far, thank you so much. Seriously, you have no idea what that does in Spotify and Apple to do that. So thank you guys so much for doing that so far. It really means the freaking world. <sighs> but, man, I'm going to see Machine Gun Kelly tonight and on Saturday. So the next episode you hear with me, I might be a little shell-shocked. I'm not. I, you- <laughs> I will live back curiously through Tony. Instagram stories. That's what I'll do. But y'all are the best. Hopefully have a fun, safe, productive weekend and weekend. Yeah. And we'll talk to you guys next time. See ya.